think about the ways how you can achieve your trees. And, and again, uh, the same thing I have to start with, which uh, that we finished last, last time, that uh, you always have to think first uh, in this case, not just jumping into the uh, methods. Of course, if you are doing Snippy and Snippy uh, recommends to, to, to continue the analysis with, with Fast3, that's okay. I, I don't see any problem with that one. Or as, so you, as, as soon as you see that uh, a pipeline is giving you a, a tree at the end, just use that tree. But if it, it doesn't, then, then you should think about how to, how to gain this. Uh, we will also speak about how to visualize how to manipulate trees. And also I will, I will show you a few tricks in, in uh, ITOL, which is I think one of the easiest way to visualize trees. So I didn't do any slides, but I found a lot of very good slides on the internet. I cannot share my screen. Uh, so I will, I will go through a few of those slides. I hope that's not a problem that I'm using other people's slides. Uh, I will I mean, probably I will do some kind of uh, uh, citation or, or reference uh, under my my YouTube video as well. But these are completely free to access on the internet, so I don't think it's a problem. Uh, so uh, this is not the one I wanted. This is almost the one I wanted. So uh, I will I will send you all of these links, and I I don't want you to uh, uh, try to memorize any, anything now because if you want, you can just go back to these resources, and and they are quite nicely described uh, and written down. Uh, I just want you to to understand the logic first, and I think this is the most important thing uh, in the first part of this meeting today. Uh, the first document is actually coming from Kevin Gorey. I think this is the same Kevin Gorey we, uh, we have in our department. So he's working with uh, the CTVT group. Uh, I think this is the same Kevin. Uh, and there will be a few other uh, slides here and there. But I think the first thing, I, I won't go through all these uh, introduction slides that what are the phylogenetic trees and why do we need them? I think all of us really, I mean, we know what, why do we want to do trees? Uh, the first and most important thing uh, here, I mean, this is, this is also important. How do you, how do you call the different pieces of your tree? But this is, I think, again, something which is for most of us is already uh, something we, we know. Uh, but I think the, the, the first most important thing is to decide what kind of method you use. And to, to decide the method, uh, and I have to go down for this, sorry for uh, uh, doing this so fast. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is the, the first thing you have to decide. And this is where the first thinking comes into picture. Uh, if you want to reconstruct your tree based on distances, uh, based on or based on on, on a sequence, uh, so of course you can make a distance uh, matrix or or pairwise distances from the sequences as well, and we will cover this too. But this is the first thing I think you have to decide, and the the reason, for example, why uh, uh, Snippy recommends fast tree because fast tree is a maximum likelihood method. That's the third one here, and maximum likelihood methods are are usually use the sequence as the input. So when I'm saying sequence, we are speaking about multiple sequence alignment. Of course, it can be a whole genome alignment, it can be a core genome alignment, it can be just a few genes, it can be just one gene. Uh, or it can be also, of course, protein sequence. Uh, and and this, is, this is what you use with maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood methods. Uh, in case of the distance-based methods, you don't have two sequences uh, under each other, but you have just one number. 
So if you have A and B genome, A and B gene, or A and B protein, you will have one number, which is representing the distance. Uh, if you think about uh, the Tuesday meeting, uh, if you, for example, use using MeSH or you are using fast fast ANI, uh, so you are globally compare genomes and not you are not going down to the gene level or or SNP level. You are just looking at uh, small k-mers that are represented in both genomes. Then what you will get back, for example, if you are using MeSH and you are extracting one thousand small k-mers from one genome and you find 800 of them in the other genome then you will get one number 0.8 that's the that's that's a that's a distance uh what you can define because 80 percent of your uh, of your extracted k-mers can be found in the other one so they are uh, 0.8 or 80 percent similar or if we are Speaking about distance, and this is what we cover as well, covered as well on Tuesday. So, if 0.8 or 80% is the dist uh, the similarity, sorry, then 0.2 or 20% is the distance between those. Okay, so it's always 100 minus the similarity percentage or one minus the similarity ratio. Uh, so in this case, you have numbers just between these, while in these cases you have sequences, and that will also determine the method you will use. Uh, you have a few different options to extract uh, uh, a tree or reconstruct a tree from distance-based methods, and you also have a few options to extract a uh, distance tree from from the sequence data. Uh, the, one of the most commonly used uh, ones for the distance-based, and here we are, is the UPGMA and the an NJ. So UPGMA stands for unweighted pairwise genetic something. Uh, the uh, actually the Wikipedia site is quite good for UPGMA pair group method with arithmetic mean. Uh, if you like the equations, then it's here, but you don't really have to uh, understand what is happening. But this is how it looks like, uh, and I think it's very easy to understand and also very easy to understand the the problems with this. So let's say that this is your distance matrix. Uh, Yes, this is your distance matrix. Just have percentages here. Uh, and the whole idea behind the UPGME algorithm is always find the two closest piece within your matrix. So here you have five species versus five species. This matrix is always symmetrical. So that's one good thing that you, if you have to process this matrix, or if you have to store this matrix in the memory of the computer, then you only have to store half of it, because this upper right half is the same as the bottom left. Always the diagonal is zero, because of course there is no distance between A and A, and there is no distance between B and B. And then uh, the program is start looking for the minimum uh, number and do uh, a few calculations. I won't go through uh, all these. I will also send this if you want to understand the calculations behind. But uh, the, the most important thing here, and the, the only reason I'm, I'm, I'm showing you uh, uh, the whole mathematics behind this method is because you have to understand uh, the main problem with both UPGMA and both neighbor joining, neighbor joining is the N and J, the other one, which are the, the, the most uh, uh, reliable, but also the most time consuming ones. The problem is uh, if you have a huge distance matrix, so for example, you are comparing thousands or tens of thousands of different isolates, for example, which is not 
rare nowadays. You know, it's it's quite often you have to uh, uh, compare thousands of them. Uh, doing the mesh part, for example, so defining these numbers one by one, these pairwise distance numbers, is actually not a, a, a big deal. It's usually quite quite fast, a few hours, maybe a few days. But then what you have to do is you have to, first of all, you have to fit this whole matrix into the memory. And as you can see, the matrix size is going up uh, as always with the square of the uh, of your sample number. So it's exponentially uh, going up. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, five samples, then you have 25 or at least 25 divided by two numbers in your matrix. But of course, if you have 1000, then you are going up to 1 million uh, numbers. So first of all, uh, you have to have enough memory if you want to do a UPGMA or neighbor joining uh, algorithm in, the, in your computer. Uh, you cannot really uh, put, I mean, I can imagine that you can put uh, the distance matrix in the memory uh, in smaller pieces, but that will, that will make the whole calculation even, even way much longer. So ideally, you put in uh, your distance matrix into the memory. But then, uh, to, to uh, reach the end of the UPGMA, which means that uh, you are shrinking your distance matrix one by one in every cycle, you have to do uh, a lot of uh, matrix uh, uh, processes in, your, in the computer. In most uh, programming languages, finding the minimum in a, in a matrix is the same as you would do here. So if I give you an Excel table uh, and, you know, 10 rows and 10 columns and 100 numbers in, in this Excel table, and I ask you to find the minimum, but you cannot, of course, you cannot, you, you, are, not, you are not allowed to use coloring. So you have to go through all the numbers. And what you would do is that you should start with, you know, uh, A1, B1, C1, D1, E1, and then go down. And if you find a very small number, you just put it, write it on a paper, and then you go uh, along. And if you find something which is smaller than your number on the paper, then you are just rewriting that. Of course, you always record the coordinates of that small number. And you just repeat this until you are at the end. Programming languages are doing exactly the same. So if you are remember our, our programming uh, course uh, or programming meetings, this is actually a four cycle, a two, two four loops embedded into each other. One four loop will go through all the numbers in one row, and this will be inside another for loop, which will go through, sorry, will go through all the columns, and the other one will go through all the rows extremely time consuming, very, very time consuming. Uh, and this is the main disadvantage of, uh, of the UPGMA and the neighbor joining algorithms as well. It's also extremely hard to make it parallel because the problem is that uh, if you want to, to uh, use multiple CPU cores to Look for, so for example, you, you, you may think that, okay, I have a big matrix, I just divide it into four sub matrices and each core will look for the minimum in these four sub matrices. And then they will find four minimum values and I only have to find the lowest number from that four minimum numbers. The problem is that subdividing a matrix to four sub matrices uh, takes time as well. Uh, so this means that uh, from one memory part, you have to put it into four different memory parts, which is already a lot of time. Or what you can do is also you can multiply your matrix uh, by four. So you can store four identical copies of your matrix in the memory. And you can ask 
the first core to work on the first part, the second core in the second part, and so on. But the problem again, multiplying a matrix takes time and multiplying a matrix takes a lot of memory. So it's not really easy to uh, speed up the UPGMA and, and neighbor joining. You may be able to speed up, but it will, be, it will never be a good scaling. So you never uh, find um, a half amount of time with uh, two times more cores. Uh, okay, so this is the UPGMA. Uh, I won't speak about neighbor joining again, something that you can, you can go through as well. Uh, and we will do some UPGMA later on, so you will see how it works. Uh, but I would like to go to the next one, which is the, the minimum parsimony, uh, which is one of the, or sorry, maximum parsimony or minimum change uh, method. So I think there is a slide later on. And again, I'm, I have to say sorry for scrolling, scrolling and scrolling here. Oh yeah, the other thing is uh, the UPGMA, UPGMA will give you a, a rooted tree. The name we're joining algorithm will never give you a rooted tree. Uh, of course, it's very easy to make it uh, rooted. So in, in this case, as you can see, uh, this part here, uh, the bottom right part is the tree, which was, for example, uh, created by neighbor joining. And if you are only looking at this tree and you are interested in this one, then to make it as a rooted tree, you can just simply include an out group. And you don't really care about where the X total is. You just only care about where it comes into your main tree and where is the root of your tree of interest. The UPGME will give you a rooted tree. Okay, so in parsimony, uh, we are only looking at changes, which is very good, for example, if you have a nucleotide sequence. So here is the example. Uh, it looks, uh, what is that tree which uh, gives you the less amount of changes between, so which that describes uh, your uh, uh, final uh, sequences with the less amount of changes. So if you are starting with AAA and you are going to AAA and AGA, that's only one change, one G in the middle here. Uh, and that will, so this is the four sequences you have at the end. So to the AAA, you don't have to change anything from AAA. For AAG, you don't have to change anything up to here and you have to change one here. For going to AGA, you have to change to uh, come up to AGA, and then it will be one of these, and you have to introduce one other change here. So all together, from one common ancestor to reach all the four different sequences, you only have to do three changes. And this is what all the, this parsimony based on, it will create all the, the uh, uh, potential versions of changes. And as you can see, if you do it, do it like this, or if you do it like this, then it will, be, it will always be more changes. So it creates a lot of different trees. It creates a lot of different versions of, of the potential evolution. And then it chooses the tree which has the, le the the last, uh, the least number of changes within it. Uh, there are many different, many problems with this one. Uh, in, 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 for example, in, in default, this is not weighted. Uh, so if it's a nucleotide change, it's okay. And, and this is from one side is, is a good, good, good news for us because most of us or most of you will, I think will work with nucleotide sequencing, sequences more. Uh, because as, as you may remember, there is no real uh, difference between uh, changes 
in in most cases. So I I, I think in in most of the uh, substitution matrices, changing from A to T, C or G, has exactly the same uh, probability. There are different uh, uh, matrices, of course, and I think I think it's <clears throat> also important that that this is highly species specific. I can imagine that uh, an AT rich genome uh, has much more, much higher probability to, to change between A and T than going from A to G or A to C or T, from T to G or T to C. So, so this is something uh, that can be changed, but in default, I think most of the programs, if you are looking for multiple alignment, uh, with with nucleotide sequences, they are just simply score uh, as one or zero as a change. So between A, A, A and A, or, okay, so between A and A, the change is zero, between A and G, the change is one. But it is the same as between A and T or A and C, okay? It is, is completely different if you are working with protein sequences. So you don't have numbers here, but you have uh, much more weighted numbers. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember that we, a few meetings before we, we looked for uh, amino acid substitu substitution matrices as well. And we saw that, for example, changing an, a leucine, leucine to isoleucine is a very small change, uh, while changing a tryptophan, which is a highly hydrophobic, uh, a big hydrophobic residue to glutamic acid, which is a small negatively charged residue, is a huge change. So in, in that case, you have to weight all these changes. And in that case, you won't count the number. So at the end, when you have uh, different uh, tree reconstructions, instead of counting how many changes you had to introduce to gain the final tree, you are uh, you will choose that uh, tree uh, that has the, the, the minimum uh, amount of weighted change at the end. And, and finally, uh, yeah, this is the weighted parsing, which is also here as well. Uh, and I think the, the, the very last one, which I want to, uh, uh, yeah, um, speak about is the maximum likelihood method. So in, in, if you have a maximum likelihood method, for example, like the FAST3, uh, as you can see, uh, the first part, this is where, this is how the, uh, the FAST3 works. The first part is actually a neighbor joining tree. So it will define uh, distances from your sequence and it will do some kind of neighbor joining. The, the word heuristic means that it will uh, uh, it, it won't go through the whole process of, of the distance matrix reduction. It will, I mean, it, it is actually written down here, but it, it means that it is only trying to uh, project from, from minimum values within the distance matrix. Uh, uh, one tree which has uh, a good probability. And as soon as that crude first tree is done, then there will be a few other steps which will refine this result. Uh, and actually at the, at the very end, uh, the, the maximum likelihood method, what it does, it it's actually takes out, I, I don't know if we have those figures here, it takes out species of the tree uh, and try to switch them uh, from one place to the other. I think it will, uh, no, it's not in this one. I saw it in another one. So it, it takes out one branch from here, puts it in, in the other place of the tree and check, checks if that makes a, a better uh, description for the, for the model, uh, for, the, for the maximum likelihood. Uh, and the problem with this one, and I think this is actually very well 
described somewhere here. Oh yeah, this one. So, so what you do uh, with, with maximum likelihood is, is that you start refining your tree and you see that your, uh, your model is fitting on your data on your tree more and more and more. So you think, okay, so you do, let's say 10 changes in one cycle and you choose the one which will give you the, the best uh, fit with your model. And then you are doing 10 changes again. And from the 10 changes, you are again, choose that one which is fitting your model the, the most. So what you are doing here is randomly introduce changes and choose the one which uh, makes your model better. The problem is that as you can see on this, this uh, figure, if you start climbing up this way and you feel that, oh yeah, it's good because I'm going up, I'm going up, I'm going up. And at the end you are ending up at the top of this left hill, then from, from this point, there is no more going up. So, and as, as many cycles you do, as many small changes you will do, you will only go down. So you will only uh, drift away from your model. Uh, but you are actually not in the good top. Okay, so, so if someone told you down here that you have to climb up this hill and you have to climb up to the highest point, then you are not in the highest, at the highest point. The highest point is here. But the problem is that somewhere here, you choose, you chose the, the wrong path. And this is always uh, one of the traps uh, with, with maximum likelihood methods. Uh, of course, there are uh, ways to, to prevent uh, this. You can repeat the whole maximum likelihood method again and again and again. So for example, 100 times. And, and then you can, you can choose the one which gave uh, the highest point or the best fit to your model at the end. But if you think about the, the whole uh, reason why you are doing a maximum likelihood, one of the reasons why you are doing max, maximum likelihood, because it's way much faster than doing the neighbor joining or the UPGMA because you don't have to work with those huge matrices. You don't have to find always the minimum value. You just have to reshuffle the tree and see if, if that gives you a better uh, solution. So let's say that uh, the maximum likelihood method is 100 times faster than doing a neighbor joining, a complete neighbor, neighbor joining or UPGMA. But the problem is that if you have to repeat this 100 times, then you are at the same uh, place as, as you were with the neighbor joining. You spend the same amount of time reconstructing your tree. So, so these are all the, uh, uh, the things you have to uh, uh, take into account when you are doing uh, uh, a tree reconstruction. I will give you a few uh, ideas. So uh, on, on, for example, What's the, what's, the, what's the best choice I, uh, for me? Uh, I think if you just want to see uh, a broad picture on, your, on, on the, uh, uh, the structure of your population, especially if it's not a big one, uh, the big one is like a few thousand. If you just have a few hundred, even up to a few hundred, and just first want to see uh, the big picture, if you have two or three main clusters, or if everything is in the same place, then I think the UPGMA is a good start. Uh, also, you have to be careful with the uh, final tree of the UPGMA. So if we go back to the uh, Wikipedia site, uh, the tree will always be ultrametric, which means that you, the, 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 the ends, the leaves will always end at the same place. In terms of evolution, that means that when C and D species uh, were divided, you know, like, like 14 million years ago when C and D species 
became C and D species from W. From that point in the last 14 million years, they are evolving at exactly the same speed. And to be honest, this is very rarely the case, you know. Uh, just think about mammals. If you have a, a small uh, body size animal, it will usually have a much uh, uh, higher, much low, much low, much much shorter uh, uh, time span. I mean, lifespan. Sorry, lifespan, uh, which means that uh, there will be new and new generations, uh, much much more often than for a, a, a large uh, animal, large size animal. Which means that every time you have a new generation, you can have. Uh, a new set of mutations from uh, uh, from the gametes. So this is quite rarely the case. But even if we are thinking about prokaryotes, uh, if something is, for example, a pathogenic bacteria and there is an outbreak, then for that species, you will have a much higher chance to, to evolve uh, much faster uh, in, in many, many ways. Or if it just simply, uh, uh, a faster dividing organism or living in a place where it can divide much faster. You know, if, if we just think about uh, prokaryotic species that can live within the soil, but also can cause some kind of infection, as soon as they are causing infections, uh, they will replicate much faster than probably they are doing it in the soil. So I think it's very rare. So I wouldn't do a new PGMA uh, graph uh, as a final tree in, in a paper if you are uh, if you are speaking about evolution for example really if you want to see how different strains how different species were evolved uh, the neighbor neighbor joining is a good choice in this case uh, but you of course you have to have an old group or you can also use one of the uh, uh, maximum likelihood methods or or did one uh, the parsimony method? Okay, uh, so the next thing I would like to if is there any questions for now for this part? If there is no question, do I have the chat window open? Oh, sorry, there is no. There is just a done from Martha. Okay. So I will I will send all these links to you. These are very very good uh, resources. I think I think it's very easy to not easy, but let's say it, this is enough if you want to understand what is happening behind the tree reconstruction. Okay, the next thing we will do is I will I will show you a, a few examples in R, and you can also do this with me. So if you open the R Studio. Uh, there is a huge uh, package for doing all of these uh, uh, three uh, manipulations in R, uh, which is called APE. But also, it's not just the APE, it's also uh, This Fangorn Fang, Fang, Fang package. So what I did uh, today before is that I actually installed this Fangorn. So if you go to the packages and say install Fangorn and say install, I won't do this again because it's, it's already installed, then it will also install dependencies if the install dependencies checkbox is checked. And I think then it will be installed as well. And maybe a few other uh, modules as well. Uh, the good thing is uh, with, with all these R packages that if you are looking for a special algorithm, so for example, if you are looking for the UPGMA, so again, uh, that, that was the package name you have to install if you want to do it now, Fangorn. And if you look for the UPGMA algorithm, there is a, a, a function called UPGMA. Uh, and there is a short 
description or a short, short example always at the end. And from this example, you can, you can actually learn usually quite a lot. Uh, in many packages, there are uh, built-in data as well. I'm pretty sure that most of you, for example, already saw that uh, uh, flower, flower data, which is one of the built-in uh, data sets for R, when you have to uh, discriminate three different uh, species by their petals and I don't know what, <laughs> so different sizes of the, 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 the flower part. Uh, we won't use, of course, that one now, but as you can see here, it has um, a, a data package as well. This, this big data package is coming from, from, the, from the same R package. And actually, you can you can usually just copy this from here, and and look for the help for this, and then you will see that it's an RNA seq data, and and you can also see where it is come from. So data have has been taken from from this place, and converted. Okay, so so if you are really looking for uh, the source of this data, you can do it. But this time we just have, I just want to show you how it looks like. So first, uh, when you say data and the data package name, this means that we are just uh, bringing in this data package into the scope. So now R has this in the memory or R studio has this whole data package in the memory. So this is, I don't know if we can, we can just simply list this yeah it's actually 47 sequences okay uh, I can imagine there is a way to print out these sequences but uh, it's not the most important thing now the most important thing is to create a distance matrix and here what we do we are taking uh, the RNA sequences, probably these sequences are already aligned to each other because the dist ML, again, if you want, you can just look for what dist ML is doing. It just calculates pairwise distances and the input uh, has, is probably already aligned. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't do any alignment. So if you want to do a uh, distance matrix calculation with R, you first have to do some kind of alignment. If you want to do nucleotide alignment, uh, I strongly suggest to use muscle or cluster W or cluster omega. These are very good multiple liner programs. I actually, I like the muscle a bit more. So again, if you just simply Google muscle aligner, this is the one. Uh, you can use uh, the uh, EBI website where you can, I think, upload a maximum of 500 sequences. This is, of course, we are not speaking about whole genomes here. So, for example, if you have RNA seq data or ribosomal, not RNA seq, but 16S sequencing data, or if you have a certain gene sequence from multiple isolates, then you can use this. If you have less than 500 sequences, you can use uh, the website. If you have more than 500 sequences, then you can use the server. These are all downloadable programs. Uh, web services, I'm pretty sure that you can download this from somewhere. Uh, and it's very easy to use. I can, I can even imagine that we already have the muscle installed as some kind of... No, we don't have it yet, but I'm sure that with Conda you can install quickly. Uh, and you just give a FOSTA file, uh, muscle we do an alignment, and the alignment can be uh, imported into, into R Studio. And you will have uh, that your, your uh, data where from which you will be able to calculate the distance. So we are now building up a distance matrix because we are using we will use the UPGMA algorithm, which is a distance matrix based tree reconstruction algorithm. So what you see, what you do here, you are 
uh, giving a name dm, uh, so it will be a, a, a variable, a distance matrix, uh, which will be filled up with distances. If you look at here, uh, the dm, for me, it's an object, a distance object, Uh, yeah, or this one. Oh yeah, I remember. Uh, with 1,081 numbers inside. What is this number? So if you look at this lower, uh, so if you look at the your your original data, it was it contained 47 sequences. Uh, can we calculate the 1,081 from 47? So actually what is, this number is, it is 47 times 46. I will tell you why it's 46. And divide by two, which is 1,081. So the reason why we are multiplying 47 by 46, because uh, we just simply exclude the diagonal from the matrix. So we don't have to uh, put uh, how one species is different from itself. So we don't put this into the matrix. That's the, if you remember the, uh, sorry, going uh, here again. So, so we don't put this into the matrix. So these numbers will be excluded. And that's why we are multiplying 47 by 46 only. And the reason why I'm dividing by two, because we are also excluding one half of the matrix, because as I told you, this is a symmetric matrix. So if you go back and you just simply say DM, so if you want to see what is inside of this matrix, and it won't be too nice now, let me try again. So if you go up, yeah, it is in multiple lines, but what you see here is that the Wallaroo, uh, and between Wallaroo and Protipus, the distance is 0 0.2, 0 0.202 something. And here you can see that uh, bottom left triangle actually from, from the distance matrix. So you will see a pairwise distance, distance between all of these. And this is what you only need for UPGMA or neighbor joining. The next thing, uh, what you have to do according to the help or the example, is to create the tree object. Let me go back here. And this is when you do the UPGMA. It was very fast because it's only uh, 47 species. And now we have a tree object. So the tree object is uh, having all the, uh, the edge uh, or, or the, the branch sizes and all the node definitions. You don't have to worry about this because you can just simply say plot tree and your tree is, is already here. It's not too nice, but if you zoom in, it's a bit nicer and you can see again what you will see here that you always have uh, the same place for all your species which means that the horse is evolving with the same speed as the gray seal or human or platypus or opossum because this is a, this is again uh, a UPGMA where uh, that's one of the constraints that everything is evolving with the same speed. If you don't want to do this, you already have uh, the distance matrix and you can just simply use a different algorithm. So we are using the same thing. We have the DM, but instead of making the tree with UPGMA, we are doing it with neighbor joining. I think it's capital NJ as far as I remember. So this was the algorithm, which will not create a, a rooted tree for us, but which will take the different speeds of evolution into account. So if you do this, and then if you 
plot the tree again, and you will see that it's actually not the same if you if you're looking at uh, uh, the sequence this way. So you have a very different tree now. Probably the topology of the tree is the same. I'm pretty sure that it's the same, but that uh, clearly the the branch lengths lengths are are very different. Uh, how this tree look like if you want to take out from the R and if you want to put it into somewhere else, it's actually very easy to do. Uh, there is a tree dot right. No, sorry, a right tree function. Uh, but you can use to write out this tree in a, a very standard format, which is the Newick format. I will, I will show you soon how it looks like. It's not as uh, very special. If you just simply say tree, so you just want to print out your tree, and it will make, put it into your console. This is how it looks like. This is this whole uh, uh, pack of numbers and strings is, can be is, is recognizable by, by, by many programs, as you will see later on. So if you just simply copy and paste this into other programs, they will draw the same tree as you can see here. Uh, be, before we go into details of this one, let me show you how this Newick uh, tree builds up, because again, this is something you will use a lot. Uh, you will see Newick trees uh, as, a, as an output uh, from many programs, and maybe sometimes you will have problems. Uh, for example, Plastel Omega uh, sometimes like to do like negative branches, which doesn't really look well. So uh, maybe there will be a time when you have to go into the details of this uh, file, or you just want to extract a specific number from here. So because of this, I will show you the, the how the ITOL works. So ITOL is, uh, I just have to look uh, or Google to, uh, for ITOL. Uh, you can use the ITOL completely, uh, it's completely free. Uh, you can also register, which is again, completely free. And if you register, you will have your, you can, you can save your trees, you can uh, uh, decorate your trees and you can save those as well. So it's a, it's a very uh, handy tool. I, I don't say that it makes the, the nicest trees, but I think because it's very fast and very easy to use, I think it's usually the first step if you want to visualize your tree. It's way much better to visualize in this one than in R because then you can just decorate your tree in iTool very easily. So let's just choose the upload first. And here I will put in a tree text. In, instead of putting in the one from the R, I will put in a much simpler one uh, without distances, just uh, showing the, the clusterization of uh, these things. So let's say that A and B are very close uh, friends to each other, so they are close species. C is a species that is also a, a close one to A and B. And then we have D and E that are close to each other, but a bit further away from A, B, and C. So as you can see here, I only used the numbers, the comma, and brackets. So there is always one bracket that is uh, uh, grouping the whole thing together. But uh, otherwise, you have these two in one group, these two as another group, and this one as the part of this bigger branch. Okay, so if you just simply write in this into ITOL, you will get a tree, which looks like this. Uh, C, D, E, something, something is not good here because C should be together with A and B. 
uh, I did something wrong. Uh, yeah, I think comma is missing from here, maybe. Yes, this is much better. Uh, there are a few problems with ITO. Uh, you can zoom in and out with your with your uh, uh, scroll. So the middle uh, scroll button on your on your mouse or or two fingers with your touchpad. But it's it's actually quite fast and it's also very easy to scroll away. So if I, for example now I lost my tree, if you lose your tree, just just click on this this magnifying glass, the, the third one, uh, fit to screen. And then you can also grab and, and uh, move your uh, tree away if you want. So here, as you can see, there is no difference between the branch length because I didn't give any branch information. Everything is, is like one unit here. This is the same length as this one. And then this, as this one, and this will be, of course, uh, the, the two times longer than a single branch like here. But this is good for us now, just to practice. Uh, the first thing what we will pra uh, practice is how to put in any information. If you want to annotate your tree, uh, and it's not a, not a huge tree, then you can annotate here on the website. If it's a bit bigger, then you can use their, again, completely free tool. So here uh, in the controls, just go to data sets and you say create data set. And you have two options. You have option to create using the web interface and you have an option to make with the iTool annotation editor, which is a, a very good tool again. It's, uh, it is working together with Excel. So if you already have an information in Excel, then, then you can clearly uh, put the data into this annotation editor, and then you can upload the file. So at the end, you will have a TXT file, as far as I uh, I remember, uh, from the iTool annotation editor, and and that TXT file can be imported here with this plus sign at the bottom right corner of the iTool. If you if you push this, then you just have to choose the TXT file you exported with the annotation. Editor, but we will just do it now here on the website web interface. The first thing what you have to do is that you have to give the type of your data. So let's say that we have five different isolates here, and we would like to uh, annotate the um, antimicrobial resistance gene presence or absence. Okay, so let's say that we are uh, annotating the blast at gene. This is a binary annotation. We are annotating the presence or the absence, okay? There are so many other things that you can see. There is a huge help here, which is a very good help, a very extensive help, describing all the different types of annotations, how you can customize them, how you can use different colors. And I like this, this dark green actually more than the blue. And I will create this data set. Again, I am using the web interface here. And I will say what changes. You, you will have this window quite often popping up. Okay, uh, so again, the field label should be blah z. And what you can do here, here is your table. Uh, we have five different species. So I will just right click on this one and I say insert new row. And I will do this a few more times just to have all the five rows. And then I will choose a and B and C and D and so on. Again, this is only good to do if you if you are doing a very small data set. If you are doing bigger, you shouldn't do it here. And let's say that A and B and C has the gene. So they have one, one, one and D and E doesn't have the blasted gene. And then you say update display and you already have, of course it is not green, but you can just change it to green and save all changes. And you already have annotation 
for the Blase gene. If you want to show what is this, then you just have to say display field labels and you already have the Blase there. Uh, it is of course not publication ready, but it's for example, for a, 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 a seminar or a, a lab meeting, this is more than enough. Uh, if you want to make it a bit more compatible with your slides, it's usually good to, I don't know why I have, okay. It's not highlighted anymore. It's usually good to make the, the lines a bit thicker. Usually the uh, four or five pixel lines are much better. And you can also change, you know, the size of the, uh, the labels here, the, the, the size of the label here. Uh, what if you think about uh, showing your results about a new AMR gene? So let's say that we just found uh, BLAZ as a new uh, antimicrobial resistance gene, and you want to show together with the presence absence of BLAZ gene, uh, the MIC values. Uh, if I'm saying something stupid, Ibrahim, please correct me. But of course, uh, as far as I understand, the MIC value is low if you uh, have a resistance and it will be, no, yes, it will be high if you, if the, the bacteria is susceptible. So it's, am I right? No, it's the other way around. It's the other way around, of course. <laughs> okay, the zone of inhibition is the one which is bigger if it's susceptible. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's go with the zone of inhibition, please, because that's a bit uh, easier for me to understand. So we will create a new data set uh, using the web interface as well. And we will say zone ZOF, zone of, no, zone of ZOI, zone of inhibition. And this will be a bar chart. And it will have a color of blue, but it will, change the color anyway so uh, and I'm using the web interface again so I'm doing the same thing as before I will make five rows and I will choose a b c and d and e as well And the zone of inhibition will be uh, very small here. So let's say it's like uh, 2.3 millimeters, uh, three, four, that way we have like 16 and 18. So you just simply push again, update display. It's a bit too long. I mean, you can zoom out like this, but it's a bit too long. So what you should do here, and uh, save all changes again, you can just simply uh, set the maximum width, except of having 1000 pixels, you can just go down to 200 and it will be a bit smaller. And you know, and now you can, you can show that uh, your, uh, your new gene that you just, uh, uh, this covered is probably one of the reasons behind this zone of inhibition difference you see. And of course you can also uh, try to find out the threshold for the susceptible and uh, resistant uh, zone of inhibition value. Okay, so uh, again, if you if you are interested in any other, oh my God, this is so fast any other kind of annotations, just go to the help. It's very, very good, really. And finally, if you want to export this, just simply use the export function here. You can uh, export to an SVG file, or you can also do PDF. The PDF will be a vector graphics, so it can be uh, magnified. Uh, it, it, uh, the resolution will be the same. I mean, it won't change the resolution because it, it is not a pixel graphics but you can also export to pixel graphical uh, version uh, to PNG. Uh, and of course, if you want to uh, see a bit more 
like bigger trees or uh, then then you can also just go back here i'm sorry you can go to ah uh, yeah this is this is one of the built-in trees uh, the tree of life but you can we can also upload our own tree and this is how i can show you that this is actually a completely standard format i just copy this text from here paste it here with high tone and because it is the same format same new format we have the same tree here and again if you want to make a nicer picture you will uh, just make the branch lines a bit thicker uh, and you can color them Oh yeah, the, the one other thing which is very useful if you want to annotate your uh, trees is to color branches, for example. So if you think that this is some, this is uh, interesting for some reason, for example, because the human are, humans are here, and you just simply click on that particular branch here and say that, okay, I want to color this clade or node or, I mean, I will usually probably color the clade and then you can say okay I think this is different from this reason or that is different from that reason uh, again it's very easy uh, if you if you are registered to the ITIL then you can just save this and you will anytime you, got, you, you go back to ITIL these trees will be there as well uh, you can always put in multiple binary multiple column based uh, data uh, it is it is very flexible uh, i think this is almost the everything i wanted to tell you today so it was quite fast actually uh, oh my god i missed your all of your uh question sorry okay so the the figure margins are too large can come from uh, a, a problem that maybe you did something before with the r and and it is uh continuously so if, if you change something before so the best the first thing i don't want to see my mails the first thing I would do if you if you have this error message is just uh, push this clear all plots uh, here. Uh, this will clear out all the previous plots and also clear out every changes you made on the on the main board. So this can help. But also, oh yeah, okay. This is this is almost always the, the problem because even if, as you can, as as you saw, mine was also quite like not not really nice on 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 this plot. So the the texts are are overlapping, which is not really nice. You can change this. It's a bit harder to change the the built-in plot function, but you can change it. It's way much easier to do it in ITIL because in ITIL you already have the. I mean, if you think that these are too small, you just simply go to the uh, label, the, the font size. It's 20, let's go up 21. So it's very easy to increase, very easy to change if you like a different character type. It's, it's way much easier to do here. But yeah, for the first view, if you want to, to see your. Uh, trees here uh, then then this is this is how you can you can work uh, it, it it quite op often happens if you for example if you did a plot before with multiple plots on one picture because that's when you have to uh, define uh, different sizes on on your plot area uh, maybe that happened with you before. Sorry for not seeing. I don't know how can I put this always uh, in the scope, this, this chat window. 
I will try next time. Right, so uh, I will send you all of these uh, links. I think they are they are really very very good. Uh, don't try to understand the equations. <laughs> there is no need to for you to understand them. You just want to use them. And and again, uh, just try to understand those slides and memorize those slides that are speaking about your choices, where to choose which one, which which uh, approach. And I think in most of the cases you are okay by, uh, to use the past three in most of our uh, prokaryotic genome studies. I think the past three is, is good. It's also very fast. Any questions? Or should we discuss anything now? If nothing, then we were fast enough to let Marta uh, have some time to go to do her stuff as well. Uh, so the, I will just, uh, in, a, in a few minutes, I will send you all these links. So you will have this. And if you want, you can save them. I will also put these up to the uh, uh, Google Drive. So it will be there as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm also uh, working on the two other uh, uh, cheat sheets I, I promised to do. One is the realignment, just the basic steps and most important options. And the other one was the, uh, the Tuesday subject uh, comparing uh, different genomes. <laughs>